Hi everyone and welcome to Lecture 7. So this week, as you would imagine by the titles, we're looking at some topics that are very close to my heart, obviously particularly the technology one. We're also looking at some school and home-based programs and how we can use them to build better relationships with our families and communities. So home-based programs, homework, and I have some interesting points of view on that that we'll discuss in tutorials as well, and our technology and the benefits and disadvantages of using technology with our early years. So let's look first at our homeschool programs. So these are the types of things where what we're looking at is how we build authentic relationships and what is the idea of homework versus enrichment and various ways of enhancing the home and school relationships. So can technology be a barrier or an enhancer for that? What are some things, and we'll go through a couple of them, the Take Home Ted, Flat Stanley and some gardening and so on. And then we're looking at embracing our technology with our apps like Seesaw and so on. So homework. What are your personal views on homework? Are you in favour of it? Is it something that causes you distress? Would you be able to defend your position? So some parents are quite dogmatic that they want to have homework for their children, even from very young, and others are a little bit more relaxed about it. So is your opinion reinforced with what is going on in schools at the moment? it's quite different between different school systems. So what we know is that good homework programs, they can form a bridge between home and school if they're done the right way. So it relies on a positive relationship with the parents and the caregivers and the school and everyone working together. So a lot of research, however, says that it's not always beneficial. So we're looking at this idea of creating effective home links, but not necessarily the idea of homework being extra work that the children take home. So what we know is that it can cause a lot of stress at home. It can be negative for the children and their development if we don't set up things correctly for the children. So when we start reading books too early, it can cause issues. When we start asking children to practice their reading and their spelling within very tight confines of certain things, it can be very negative for their feelings about doing reading just as a casual relaxation activity and so on. That's for children and for parents, it can be traumatic for them as well. So what we want to look at is this idea of homework that isn't necessarily in just completing something for the children that is just doing more schoolwork. We want it to be this idea of enriching what's going on in their lives. So think about how do you build different experiences. So in contrast to the idea that it doesn't provide extra mm, problems for the home, what we know is that we can have student achievement rising when teachers regularly assign homework, but not when it's more of the same work they're doing at school, because then it relies on the students conscientiously doing it. So there's a range of different things that we can consider appropriate. So we need to think about what is the amount per night? So you might have really negative memories of homework, particularly in your later years of primary school and of course in your high school. So remember that coming home, you had to sit down, you had to do your homework and so on. So we have to think about what is the purpose of homework. It's not meant to be just getting them to do more of what they've done at school. So in the early years, it should be that opportunity for the students and the parents to talk about what's happened at home. It might supplement something that they've been doing. So particularly, we often think about it from that idea of their reading and their early numeracy activities and everything else. So think about how you make it really relevant for the children at the developmental level that suits them. So potentially our kindy, well, pre-kindies, kindies and pre-primaries, 
they're just going to be doing some reading of some sort. We don't want to make it too difficult for them. So we want them all to understand different homework routines, but we don't want it to be onerous for the children and onerous for the parents as well, because no one's going to do that. So we want it to be short and sharp, getting them to read, getting them to think about their sight words, getting them to do some simple phonics work and so on. So it's building that idea of what's happening at school and the parents understand what's happening, but it's not making it a whole other level of different things that they have to do. So we want to make sure that it is not becoming an onerous task for parents. So think about when is it due? So it might be that they have, you know that certain families have soccer two nights a week or they might be heavily, I find the ones who are doing gymnastics and dancing, there's heavy involvement in certain types of the year. So lots of people have very busy lifestyles. So it might not be something they do every night. It might be something that is assigned on a Monday and then things have to be completed by the Friday in some way. So always be aware of the children with any special needs and how that will impact on their family as well, because those children might be going to speech therapy after school. They might be going to OT. They might have uh, special swimming classes that they go to to develop their strength in their upper arms, all those different things. So be really aware of what else is going on in families. So what are some suggestions when we're thinking about things at different year levels? So in pre-primary, you might have something like take home Ted. They get him once a term and they fill in a little activity sheet. They might take some photos. They might upload some things into a particular program that you have. You might have a phonics activity. They might have some card games that they might be able to do. It might be something that is linked through a seesaw activity that they do at home. There's a variety of different ways that you could do your phonics. It doesn't necessarily have to be a written activity. I used to have some little matching cards that they could do and that was a really easy way and they just moved them through on a folder in some way. So it could be something that they do each day and they discuss what they've done at school. It doesn't necessarily have to be extra work of any sort. It could also be once a week they have a particular day and they prepare their news and we will talk a little bit more about news as we go through but thinking about how they write down their who, what, where, when, why, how they answer their simple questions and they do a bit of news preparation. So those sorts of things can be something that they could do over the period of a week. So then in year one, you will have potentially moving into your home readers. You'll have possibly something with their spelling, so their sight word list. You might have a phonics activity, getting them to sound out some things, getting them to rehearse different ways of putting sounds together and so on. You might have actual spelling words. They might or might not be a sight word list. You might have a simple maths activity. It might be that they're practicing their friends to 10 or they're starting their basics of moving beyond counting, some place value activities and so on. And you might have something like your take home TED where that happens once every so often. And you might have again your news preparation. Then by the time they're getting to year two or three, you'll have a home reader of some sort. They'll probably have some spelling words or sentences that they're doing. They might have a maths activity. You might start their times tables activities and so on. You might have a mental maths sheet or some mathletics activities that you're doing. And again, you might have some news preparation. So these are the examples of different things that you possibly could have in different schools. So some schools will be very emphatic about what will and won't happen as part of homework. So most schools will have a school policy of some sort. And this is an example one from a school. So it says parents will be advised of the homework expectations beginning of the school year. The maximum daily allocation will be kindy pre-primary just read to by the parent and guardian. So at that point, the school has made a decision not to send home readers home with their pre-primaries. In year one and two, it should just be 10 to 20 minutes. And then for years three, four, five, six, it moves up. So it's not an onerous task for parents. Once the time limit has been reached, homework should cease regardless of whether it's finished or not. So that means that a child should have an opt out 
and a family should have an opt out. So it says students will use diaries in years three to six to record their reading and homework. Those diaries could be a physical handwritten diary. They may be a digital diary as well. So diaries are the way that schools and caregivers communicate with one another. It's where you'll write little notes and so on. And it's asking that diaries are signed by the parents and teachers each week. So therefore parents can write in, we've had a really tough week. We've been over to grandma's, she's been sick. We haven't done any homework and the child shouldn't be punished for not doing the homework because the parents have written it in. So think about how do you actually make sure that you communicate effectively with the caregivers about what you're expecting with homework and how can they share with you what they're expecting about homework. It can be part of your parent meetings and so on. So think how do you build that in at the very beginning. So Bronfenbrenner supports the idea that we help to educate parents about what's going on in every aspect of their lives, their social, intellectual, moral lives. So Bron from Benner encourages that interaction between our parents, child and the community and therefore how we create those authentic relationships of the teacher and the caregivers. Now caregivers want to know more about what they could be doing at home to assist their child. Most will ask you what can we do. Sometimes they will be very insistent about what they want to be able to do. So we can assist them informally with off-the-cuff discussions outside the classroom or we can actually get them in for different meetings in some way. So organise some opportunities for the parents and caregivers to understand what you're doing in the classroom. So that could be understanding what a home reader is. So if you are told by the school that you must provide home readers from pre-primary onwards, then you, you make choices and you work out, right, how am I going to do this? Are we using levelled readers? Are we following along? particular phonemic awareness discussions are we using books that are more science of reading approach where we're getting we're teaching the children how to decode them as opposed to prediction style texts so work out what and how you're providing those home readers and then help the parents to understand what they can do to actually help because what we have is some schools go down a pathway of predictive readers and the parents think they're helping by covering up the pictures, other text and so on and want the children just to recognise the word. And then we have the opposite happen when you're providing decodable texts where the children are telling them the wrong strategies that we're not encouraging at school. So offer opportunities so the parents will know what and why you are doing certain things. Don't just talk at the parents. Let it be an opportunity for them to ask different questions as well. So I know that I would often have for my kindies, I would have a parent meeting the year before. So they would be able to prepare their child over the Christmas holidays for what needed to happen. And that was a really good opportunity to explain that it's great if every child in kindy can be toilet trained before they start kindergarten. And then parents were like, oh, I hadn't even thought of that. And it just helps them to understand what to do. Also, before they go and buy all of the backpacks that they're going to have, before they buy the lunch boxes, we go through the pros and cons of different things that they can provide. And then at the beginning of the year, we would have parent meetings for pre-primary, year one, year two, where we would explain our educational programs. So... Think about how you make sure that parents and caregivers are really understanding what and why things are happening in the classroom. So you want to make sure some of those meetings will be structured and some of them will be those informal discussions that you can have outside classrooms. And really be clear about what is actual needed information versus what is information that the parents would be able to find out through a little parent information booklet. Sometimes we give them so much information and just give them a little booklet, a little website where things are that can give them information at other regular periods as well. So let's explore some of our ways that we can create different parent and 
teacher communication modes and different things that could happen as part of home programs. So what we have is news. Now, news can be fantastic in a classroom or it can be the most boring thing that you have to sit through. It's all about how you want to structure it. So planned news is going to be for every child within reason and you would schedule every child in every week or every two weeks depending on how you want to run your news sessions. I find the best way is to make it quite structured. We have a process, a set of rules that we all follow, the explanation for it is written out and sent home to the parents at the beginning of the year and then when it is the child's turn for the first few times I would also send a little information sheet home for the caregivers as well that they could go through. So we would then implement rules and guidelines for sharing that would be the person giving the news but also for the listeners so it might be that they have to all sit in one very large group and listen and then they're encouraged to ask five questions and the person who has told the news gets to ask gets to choose who would like to ask the questions other schools might have their news conducted in smaller groups with that same structure that follows on. So you choose the way that you want to set your news up. Please don't make it that every child has to speak all the time and so on. I would let my kindies, pre-primaries and year ones choose when they were ready to do it. I would always schedule them in and then I would send a little note home saying, I'm not sure whether they're ready yet. Do some prep and let's see if they're ready to do it this week. And every so often, the child would still go, nope, not ready. And you go, okay, that's fine. Let's try again next week. So we're wanting to develop their verbal skills. And it's about being able to effectively communicate your needs and effectively communicate with your peers in different forms. It's about helping the child to develop some self-confidence in their own ability to share in some way. I love seeing the little things that they bring in. So you might set up rules around what they can and can't bring in. So for example, sometimes I would say, right, this term for news, we're not going to have any toys. We're going to have photos. So I want you to bring in some photos of different things that you would like to tell us about. So it could be photos of their favorite family members. It could be photos of their dogs. It could be photos of their pool and all the pool toys that they have. So get them to think about different things that you wanna have. You might have themes that you run through. Some children will only bring in toys and that's okay, but sometimes you want them to share something else as well. I like them to do preparation. So I like them to have a plan and to think about how they rehearse it and what they want to do. Now you can also get them to take a video. So if you know what's going on, the parents can make a little video and they can airdrop it to you first thing in the morning. They can send their iPad in and they can play the video and so on. So there's a lot of different ways that we can do news that doesn't always have to be the one child standing up going, good morning, everyone. On the weekend, this is my new toy that I bought and so on. So think about how you want to structure your news in your room. If you have a look online, there's actually some fabulous sites that explain different ways that you can do news or sharing within a classroom or an early years centre. So think, what do you want your news to look like that would still allow them to develop really good verbal skills, confidence, create that homeschool connection and so on. So let's think about beyond news, how else can we help them? So what we want to do is we want to make sure that we're helping our parents to understand how we view home as a learning centre. So we want potentially to give them some resources or to help them understand how they could use what they have at home to enhance the learning experiences that happen at school. So you want to potentially encourage activities that are away from the home. And this is where you will be able to see lots of fabulous teachers have created what we call homework grids. 
And in the homework grid, it has a range of things. And it might be that one of the activities for the week is that they have to take a walk and they have to collect something from their walk and bring it into school the next day. And that goes on to our walking table. And so things that we have found that are interesting, and it might be that they bring in a special leaf that they found a stick. It might be that they find a feather or it could be that they have seen something and they take a photo of it and they can bring that in with them and so on. So think, what do you want to do that encourages that linking between home and school? Because oftentimes we view homework as essentially just an addition of schoolwork. So let's think about some other ways that we can create this idea of home and school connection. We've got homework, we've got news, so let's start some others. Now, this was a particular program that was really, really popular for quite a while. Now, Flat Stanley, he's a book, so everyone makes their own Flat Stanley and you can have him go on different adventures. So with Flat Stanley, you can mail him off to different places. You can take him home with you. He can be something that children take lots and lots of photos with and then all the parents can add to a particular website and so on. So think about what and how you can do something like Flat Stanley. Again, do a Google Flat Stanley ideas for a classroom. And particularly in our digital world, there's lots of things that you can do. I've had children when they go on holidays, you know, the kids that leave an extra week or so earlier on the school holidays, we do something like Flat Stanley and then the children are able to email us little things that they've done where Flat Stanley has gone and so on. Most years that I had early childhood, I would have a take home TED or something similar. So we would have a diary, so they would have a little scrapbook. Parents would be able to take little videos or photos. I would have the most amazing things. So Ted would go to the gymnastics practice. He would go to soccer practice. He'd be sitting on top of the ball. There would all be these different things. So Ted had to go on adventures. And sometimes adventures were little adventures. So he just went to the backyard and he found all the different things in the backyard and then he would have bigger adventures. So you want to make it easy for the parents. So think of ways that they can do it without having to print out things and so on. So think about incorporating some digital things. So I've seen Take Home Ted where he goes home with an iPad. So he goes home with one of the class iPads and in there is the Teddy, an iPad, uh, instructions, laminated instructions and so on and then ideas. So it's a case of the child then makes choices and it all goes home in a little backpack and the child wears a little backpack home and that's what it has all the information in it. And then if you're doing things like taking the iPad home at the same time, then you get the children to take the photos, you come back and then they can all go into one place, oftentimes through Seesaw or through somewhere else. And with Seesaw, you can make a class blog and that might be where Take Home Ted goes. So then you get to see their family, you get to see their other people in the family, the siblings, the dogs, the cats, the, fa the everything else. Just help the parents to understand not too much. We occasionally had where we had photos in the shower and Ted got a bit wet. So we kind of had to explain that that wasn't so good in different ways. Now, most years that I have taught, I've had class pets. So I have had birds. Birds are beautiful to have. Little budgies and canaries are fabulous. I've often had fish. Fish are great. They're easy, low maintenance. I, I'm allergic to rabbits, so I've actually not had rabbits in the classroom, but I've had lots of colleagues who have. Chickens, I would get the chickens every single year at Easter time and we would, I would drive up, grab the eggs that were going to hatch in three days, three to five days, bring them back, pop them in the incubator. The children would be able to come and observe them. Then we would keep them for a few weeks and then we would send them either back to where we got them from or they would usually go home with some parents or grandparents from the classroom. So we would, as we had started the chicken program, we'd have a little sign up sheet with however many chickens ended up hatching and then they would be able to choose. So with our class pets, they would often go on visits home. The fish wouldn't, 
but the birds would. I had a bird cage that we would keep in the classroom and then I had a little take home cage that we would use as well. I would often have rats as well and they were great to send home to. So our class pets, they would go on visits. And again, it's about helping the children to understand when they go home, how they have to take care of them and so on. Now, with any of those, no, not the fish, but with the birds, the rabbits, the chickens or the rats or mice that you would have, we would need school approval, obviously, but you would also need approval from the Animal Ethics Committee. Uh, and that is just a form that you fill in and you write down how you're taking, where you're getting the animals from, how you're taking care of them, and then what you're going to do with them at the end of the time that you have them in the classroom. Particularly, say, with the chickens, where I only had them for a short period of time. When I had my birds or my rats, I had them for a much longer extended time and they essentially died and so on, and just through normal events that were just normal birth and death and so on. But you do need approval that you are not experimenting on the animals, that you are planning to take good care of them and so on. I've also had the stick insects. They make fabulous pets in the classroom as well. Now, this is great. I've had a community garden lots of times when I've worked in schools. So the last school that I worked at, we were bordering a bushland. So we set up a community garden that we could all use and we all contributed to it. So it's about getting the parents in, helping them. And you would always have mums or grandmas or dads or somebody that loved gardening. So Bunnings is usually a fabulous support. If you want to create a community garden of any sort, you can build a garden at the school or you may have somebody who lives just down the road that they're going to put it in their front yard. We've had that in some schools as well. And we walk down and we do some things and then we walk back again. We can create our video and photo diaries to show what's going on in our garden. I've had schools where they've made a website all about it. And of course, we can then do cooking classes and get the parents to come in or caregivers or extended family members to come in and do some different cooking with us. All right, so that's our ideas of different ways to connect. Let's look at this idea of technology. So... Technology is in every single family, in every single home and in most centres, classrooms and so on. It is and can be an amazing form of connection between your home and school and your community. What we know is that the last decade has been the greatest growth of technology, social media, all of our devices that are now in schools and so on. You haven't gone through school with the amount of devices that the children have access to now. So stats from the Bureau of Statistics say that 85% of children under 15 have access to a home computer, a home tablet and so on. We have over 95% of homes in Australia have access to the internet. So we only have 5% of homes that don't have access to the internet and most of those are in our remote areas. So we do know, of course, that First Nations students and children from very small schools, they're potentially going to be lacking in basic computer and iPad skills. We have the third highest internet usage in the world. And one in four children owns a mobile phone. What I'm seeing more and more of now are the smartwatches as well. So this is our children is defined as children under 18. However, what we're looking at with this stat is even in our primary schools. So the youngest I've heard of kids having a mobile phone is around the year two age at the moment, but not very many of them. So most of our young children that we would be working with in the early years don't have access to phones. So we need to make sure that when we're talking about equity and equality, that technology does not become a barrier for it. So it changes the way that we access information. So it means that we have to be very conscious that everyone has equal access. 
So we want to make sure that because children don't have the necessary funds or that they are from a different upbringing, that they still have access. Because what really came out during COVID in particular is that it can widen the gap between the rich and the poor and those who are able to access and those who are not and therefore giving them equality does not happen. So at school, we want to make sure that everyone can access everything. It does restore a bit of the balance, but what I find is that a lot of schools, there will be a vast proportion of your children who have way more technology at home than they ever do at school. So when we look at technology, we want to make sure that it encompasses our standard of television, our computers, our internet, our mobile phones, our smart boards, digital cameras, our iPads, our game consoles, and so on. There are very few families in any place in Perth that wouldn't have access to a whole lot of those things on that list. Obviously not smart boards. Now, in implications. What we know, not all technology is great. I'm seeing in my teaching career a vast difference in the climbing abilities of children in our early years. I'm seeing huge differences in the way that children are using their bodies generally. And that's not a positive difference either. It's a quite a negative difference. So that's been in my teaching career. And a lot of that I do attribute to lots and lots of technology use. I'm seeing a lot less outdoor play and that I'm finding is impacting on their creativity. That the freedom of play and toys and so on is often being handed over to technology in some way. So we want to make sure that we're using technology appropriately and that we're helping our parents and caregivers to understand how we can do it. We have to be really conscious of how we ensure that children are not being exposed to inappropriate content, particularly pornography. So when I'm working with early years, a lot of parents are very concerned about it and we have to help them to understand how to put in appropriate safety features so that they are protecting their children from inappropriate access to things. And sometimes parents just don't know. They don't know how to use their technology appropriately. They don't know how to impose screen time limits. They don't know how to set the devices up to have the appropriate restrictions in place. So some things for teachers. We want to make sure that we have equity of access for everyone. We want to make sure that our skills are appropriate of how to use it effectively. We want to make sure that we are communicating with our parents and caregivers. We want to make sure in a classroom that we are not using the iPad to play, that we are setting appropriate limits. We want to think about our good policies that we have in our school to make sure that we are using technology in the best way possible. I can literally talk for days around this topic, but please just know that not all schools have great policies in place about this and that you need to be the advocate for using technology correctly. It's not that we don't use technology in the early years, it's that we use it in a developmentally appropriate way. So when we're talking about that, one of the first things that you will have parents talk to you about and ask you questions about is screen time. So these are the guidelines from the Australian government. And so it is no screen time for children younger than two years. That should be none at all. And yet we know what we see walking around the shops and so on and cafes and everything else. There's children on phones left, right and centre. So what we're, the advocates are saying is no screen time for children younger than two years. No more than one hour per day for children aged two to five years of age. And that's not looking at school-based technology use when we are doing creation. That's looking at what we would call our sedentary recreational screen time. So that is where they are just passively watching YouTube or actively engaging in games, but there's not exactly the greatest amount of learning that's going on. And then when we're looking at our early years, 
of our formalized schooling, so our five and six and seven year olds that we're looking at in our pre-primary year ones and twos, it's saying not more than two hours of sedentary recreational time, not including schoolwork. So that means outside of school. So this is where lots of schools get caught up in this idea of no more than two hours. And you have parents who are actually checking the screen time on the personal devices and things like that. It says not including schoolwork because the way that children use devices at a personal level and the way that children use devices at a school based level should be different. So we want to make sure that we are helping parents understand how we use technology in school versus how they use technology at home. I spend a lot of my time in parent meetings helping parents to understand there is a difference between them and they just don't know what we can do with them at school. So what do we have to talk to them about? <laughs> These are some really interesting things. I talk to them about limiting their own screen time and I get them to look at their own phones and look at their screen time because there is a strong relationship, surprisingly so, between parents' screen time and those of their children. Teach them how to co-participate, so where they do screen time together. So if show them some great apps that you could use with your children as opposed to let the iPad babysit the child. Absolutely. There are some times when just popping a video on and walking away because you need to go and finish doing that task around the house. There is absolutely nothing wrong with doing that. It's when that happens for four hours of a day, that's when we have a problem. So helping the parents to understand how they can use the devices and the tools that are on the device to set some time and content rules. So teaching children about the settings, teach, uh, teaching parents about the settings. Finding, help the parents to look at how they can balance their day with activity and play to support their mental health as well as some screen time. And encourage children to self-regulate their screen time. So get them to make some decisions about when they want to use their time. With my own children, they would have a certain amount of time that they could have and they would be able to choose which time of the day that they wanted it. And would they want to have their hour or their two hours in half hour blocks and I would put the timer on or did they want to have it as one gigantic one where they would just binge in their screen time and what they would want to do. I remember Nick often chose to binge on his screen time and he would just have a great big chunk of playing something. Then we would have to deal with it afterwards, but that was his choice about things. So then our recommendations for caregivers. What we want to try and do is make sure that we are recommending ways for parents to blend, play and everything together. We want to recommend and talk to parents about how they don't just use all of the prepackaged apps. We want to make sure that we as the teachers are we're reviewing the nature and content of the violence and so on before we let the children view it. We want to help parents to understand the emotional effects of inappropriate content. We want to make sure that everybody understands safety and where they can seek some extra support. There is amazing government websites and so on that you can find support. I'll try and put some of those up into Blackboard as well. So when we think about what we're going to do in our tutorials this week, we're going to review our homework, home-based programs and our technology. And of course, Yay, we've got our first presentations that I'm really looking forward to. And then our next week after that, we're looking at intervention and I'm hoping that I will get a guest lecture from an occupational therapist explaining what they do and how they can support us and how we can support them as well. So thanks everyone. Look forward to seeing you in our tutorials.